It is the Rhetoric Warriors podcast back on the air. I don't know if it's air. What is it? Waves? Electronic magnets? Tubes? I think it's on the tubes. Is it glass? Like, isn't it Google Fibers? What are we on? Zeros zeros and ones. Zeros and ones. Well, we are uh, catching the rhetorical boomerangs, throwing them right back into the faces of those throwing them at us. We are... uh, we're doing complicated times require sophisticated techniques, more understanding of how messages work, how to defend yourself, how to build good ones. So come on, get your learn on. It's the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. I'm Dr. Dan, American rhetorician, uh, escape professor, late night comedy writer, all the things, founder of Rhetoric Warriors. Uh, the purpose of this podcast, I talk to comedians about their politics and their careers and I let them, I uncensor them and let them do whatever they want that they don't want to do in clubs anymore because of too much blowback. That's interesting. I sometimes have people from opposite perspectives than mine, and I convert conservatives on the podcast. I take them through a, a recovery process. And uh, I talk to persuasion pros, message pros, anybody that does something with public words. And that's kind of what we're doing today. I've got another entertainment pro on here. I'm going to put you under comedy pros. That's sure. Be your, your thing today. Uh, this guy I've known off and on, like we've, we met at the Austin film festival years ago and, uh, he's the guy who helped invent talking meat. Like he invented some talking meat. <laughs> I worked with monsters, cartoons, stretchy characters. He's been at Turner cartoon network, adult swim, Disney, Netflix, you name it. He's probably been in the animated bowels of that organiz- organization. And, uh, one of the original producer directors, creators, Producers, producer and editor, like there was no, it's a long story, but yeah, I got a producer credit on Aqua Team, even though I did, I was not like, I was not above the line, let's put it that ah, way. Ah, okay. Uh, Aqua Tween, hung, Aqua Tween, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. So we'll talk about that a little bit today. Jay Wade Edwards. Thank you for using my full name. Jay Wade is a cool name. It's not bad. I like it. My grandfather was Wade, was George Wade. Um, so yeah, I like it. I have to go by it because there's a porn director named Jay Edwards and jayedwards.com is a bondage porn site and it's not actually me. Yeah, no, I'm sure it's not. That's good cover, man. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, not it, me. It, it, the internet is lazy and uh, he will sometimes get my children's television credits. <laughs> which is no, I like saying Jay Wade's fun to say. It's, hey man, it's yeah. Jay Wade. It's better. So like yeah. Jay Lowe or something. Don't Google me at work. Uh, I wonder if like everybody's probably got some, if you really knew all the porn stars, everybody's got some kind of doppelganger in the porn industry. I, I mentioned this in, in a, in a talk with uh, a, a college class last week that I was uh, helping a friend out on. And it turns out everyone on the panel had, had the equivalent of some porn star with their name. Nice. I like it. So, so I'm not that original. All right. So here we go. Let's do this. Uh, run us just a little bit of background. You, you started in Georgia. Are you a Georgia guy? You were in Atlanta. Oh, well, I grew up in Florida, but escaped. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and then went to college in Alabama, Auburn, Alabama. So you didn't escape uh, that far. <laughs> I didn't escape that far. It was eight hours away from my parents, which seemed like the right distance to go to college. That sounds about um, right. And I liked Auburn, uh, you know, uh, football season's still fun. Uh, and uh, I was I in I, chops. Like I Auburn, some football chops, right? It's you kind of rely it's, it's, on Auburn to, yeah. I went to a lot of football games at Auburn. Yeah. Um, big Southern, you know, it was about 20,000 students. Um, it's mostly an engineering and agriculture school, neither of which I really fit into, even though I really liked the school and wanted to go there. So I ended up in public relations or business. That wasn't really me either, but um, eventually I took a, a video editing class this was in the era of videotape, not yeah. pre-digital. Um, and I went in to edit a project and edited for like 10 hours in a row and forgot to eat or pee or do anything else. Um, and I just loved it. So I changed my major the next day to communications and have been editing ever since. Ever since. Hardcore. Hardcore yeah. editor. Yeah, that, that was 30 years ago. What are some other names for editors? Like, are you, chop, are you choppers? Are you chop shop? What is Cutters. Yeah, like you'll you'll use the word cut a lot, even though it's all digital. You used to use scissors or razor blades when it was film. 
Yeah, I remember some of that stuff. I my son is an editor. He's nineteen, and um, he's about to jump into a job with Psionics out in San Diego. And he's never, you know, he's never done anything that hasn't been like three computer screens and is it so? Sure, sure. Um, I was I was lucky in that um, uh, I moved to Atlanta from college in 1991, and that's when the very first digital nonlinear editing computers were being manufactured and used professionally. Um, so I, my first job was at one of two uh, editing facilities in Atlanta that had an Avid. Nice. There were two in the whole city and I happened to get a job at one of them. Um, well, that's fortuitous. It was very fortuitous. So uh, um, I was doing some, mostly I was an assistant editor, but I worked up to being like kind of the night manager where I would digitize the tapes that came in during the day overnight for the next day's edit sessions. So I was in charge of keeping the computer running essentially, which was not easy now, but it certainly wasn't easy back then. The biggest hard drive you could buy was 600 megabytes. Oh, wow. And it was the size of a car battery and weighed just about as much. Yeah, it's interesting when you look back, like even those jobs, you know, that have recently disappeared, like that one, like the night guy who has to turn the ed stuff, make it editable for the next day, like digitizing it. It's interesting because you still use the terminology of film production in digital. You know, if you're shooting digital, you still have to make dailies, which is converting one digital file into seven or eight or 10 different flavors of digital file so that the director can review it. Or it goes to an archive at a very high resolution or it goes to a you know, medium editable resolution for the editor. Um, so you still use dailies and you still use a lot of that terminology, even though it's you know, not film anymore. It's an interesting version of history, right? I mean, the, the amount of, of uh, archived stuff that's been made for, for all these different projects is probably bigger. I mean, just, just the massive library of that stuff. Most of it never gets used. It gets cut and right. I don't know where it goes to live, but it's a certain way of documenting the world and reality that just has never existed before. This era of like from, I don't know, from the digital era on, I feel like all that history is going to disappear. Like, like even now, um, you know, the, when in the 90s and, and, and early 2000s, when you were mastering, when you were creating a master of a TV show, it was a piece of tape. It was a digi beta tape or a D2 tape. Now, there is no longer um, VCRs that can play those tapes back. Right. Like all that technology is gone. Like the, the, the head that read the videotape, like those heads are not being manufactured anymore and they wear out. So there are thousands of hours of videotape that can never be played back. Just um, locked away in you, a book that nobody can read anymore. It's yeah, like like you, there's no Rosetta Stone for digital. Um, some some film companies are still archiving on film. They're like that's the long term. Like there's resolution lists. Like there's no resolution to it because it's a physical piece of media. Um, well, some people are still archiving on 35 millimeter film because that's kind of um, technology proof. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so bizarre. Like nobody, you know, when you get in the guts of things like that, the guts of production, and you start to see like technology constantly rolling through. And here comes another big wave of technology to shift everything. Like I had a buddy who was a, a colorist, I think, uh, whatever it's called in, in video for a while. And worked, worked in it for quite a while, made, it, made his living at it. And then he sort of became a stand-up and left that stuff. And at one point was like, maybe I should go back into that. And he looked at it and he like, like, I don't know anything. I don't it's all changed. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one piece of advice I often give to people is be ready to learn all new technology every five years at least. You know, that's just part of the job. If you're going to be an editor, you're going to work in post-production, there's new technology you're going to have to learn every every five years. So just get used to it. So do you like that? Are you a technology guy? Do you like absorbing new techs? I do. I certainly do. I, I certainly have my preferences um, of what I like to work in and what, what I feel like works best for me. Like I'm kind of, I like technology, but I'm also kind of a minimalist. 
I'm also anti-technology. When when I started working at Netflix three Netflix Animation three years ago, there were it was a new studio to house all the animation projects that they had in development. And so I walked in and I was like employee number seventy two, and now there's eight hundred. Um, and they asked me what I wanted to work on. I got to pick what kind of computer system I wanted, what kind of tech, you know, I, I prefer Premiere to Avid, so I got to work in Premiere, you know, what kind of storage I wanted. And as I was kind of designing this from scratch as I preferred it, as opposed to working for Disney or another, you know, really the only other monolith that I've worked for is Disney, whereas every editor worked on the exact same computer system at Disney, whether it was appropriate for your production or not, which sucked. That sounds like um, Disney. Yeah, but uh, then again, they had 85 editors and that's a lot to manage if every editor is working on a different sure. system. So, man, you know, studio management wise, I understand. Yeah. Show production wise, it's a nightmare. So Netflix was new and they like, do whatever you want. So I ended up with no mixing board because oftentimes editors are, you know, they have like a 64 channel mixing board on their desk and they use it as a volume knob. Right. So I reduced and reduced and reduced until I had nothing on my desk, but a monitor, a keyboard, a mouse, and a knob for volume. Like, oh yeah, there's this, it was just like a heavy round knob. It was metal and it had a, a hash mark on it where this is your volume where you work at. You know, if you want to hear something louder, but this is the volume where you always work at. So it was literally like a volume knob and a keyboard. And that's all I had on my desk. And it was glorious. Nice. So I'm a, so yes, I like technology, but I like to minimize it and only use the appropriate pieces. Long story. Well, well that's one of the things I'm impressed by. Like, so I've always worked in, in the creative, you know, I've always been the, the writer and messing around with those knobs and those dials. And like, I get super fascinated by word choice and tone and, and you know all the tiny minutia within that stuff but when i see people who are super tech and are working it all the time the adjustments that they make in order like that in order to make hybrid systems and you know something that's adapted to their ear and their eye and, and the way they like to work it's pretty cool to see those things emerge for sure for sure um and i would uh, i switched from you know most editors use new two computers side by side so you have a lot of space left and right, but that's not really the space you need. You really need vertical space, not horizontal, because you're working on a timeline. And I might have, on the current show I'm working on, I've got over 20, 24 audio channels that I'm juggling with split track, you know, original dialogue, a bunch of sound effects, and then music. And then I might have 12 or 15 layers of video because I'm conforming animation from overseas and I've got to be able to have previous versions that we can look at quickly. I've got to label everything anyway. So yeah, I need vertical space to edit. And so I got one big monitor and people would walk into my edit suite and be like, wow. <laughs> it was just like, no, this is the appropriate thing. And no one had ever questioned why we didn't just do it this way. Right. You know? So not that I was the originator of that. I stole it from another editor, but, um, but yeah, the right That's tool for the right, right The piecemealing of everything. Like when you find a good idea, you yank it over and like eventually you become a collection of all the things that you've seen and tried and have failed not. And that's why when you run into somebody that to me, like a, a real pro, like a super pro at something, you're buying all those choices that they've made for the last 15, 20 years. That's right. And that's why they can do stuff so fast. It's just incredible to watch how quickly, you know, they assemble. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, you, you do the same thing, you know, like I use the same keystrokes a thousand times a day. And if I can eliminate one of five keystrokes then that saves me 20% of my work all day <laughs> long. So yeah. And moving the pandemic has, has caused a whole other, you know, complication with that because I'm working remotely. I'm dialing into another computer remotely and that's another bunch of steps and it's a PC instead of a Mac and that's a nightmare. But otherwise, working from home has been fine. <laughs> I like it. So talk about some of the creative stuff. Take us back to Aqua Teen and, and uh, roll us through your sort of creative experience with this uh, industry a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, I got my first job in Atlanta, as I said, working at that post house 
on Avid Media Composer, the first generation of Media Composer. And I did that for three, four years. And I got a job at Turner Broadcasting because they had just invested in Avid Media Composers and they had two. They didn't know how to keep them organized or keep them running. So my first job was to like organize them so multiple editors could work on them and not step on each other's toes or delete each other's media, you know? Um, so I did that and then I had a choice to like go into management or go into editing and I just preferred editing so much. So, so I went into editing full time while keeping the things organized, you know, hurting editors is definitely hurting cats. Um, yeah, everybody, everybody yeah. in production and it's all hurting yes. some different type of cat. Yes. So um, of course I gravitated towards more long format, more storytelling kind of editing. But at Turner um, in the 90s, uh, it was just, you know, Turner's uh, programming was sports and reruns. So the only original programming was either like sports packages or commercials for the reruns um, or, or, you know, network packaging, that kind of thing. So I did that off and on for a couple of years. But the only um, long format storytelling was really at Cartoon Network. And the only show was Space Ghost Coast to Coast. So that's the first kind of episodic thing I worked on. That which was if you a beloved know, show, right? I mean, that it's, show, yeah. It's a, that, it's a yeah. great show, yeah. yeah. Um, and it holds up because even back then it was about nothing. It was very Dadaist humor to begin with. And they'd get C-list celebrities. And the way the show was produced is they'd do the interview first with someone pretending to be Space Ghost, the animated superhero who now has a late night talk show. And then they would rewrite all the questions and re-edit the responses for comedic purposes. Um, the other variable in this scenario is the voice uh, artist who voiced Space Ghost, a guy named George Lowe. He's still around. He's still doing voices. He's a crazy person. Um, and he came out of radio. So where, you know, um, look at that kind of bombastic voice that was announcing the radio call letters which is the perfect voice for Space Ghost because he's also bombastic in that way. Right. But I wouldn't say George is the best actor, which is no, 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 no great slight to George. He's a great voice guy. Um, so the only lot, but he would also go on these 30 minute rants in the middle of the voice session. So for a 12 minute cartoon, I might get 90 minutes of voiceover and five minutes of the script and the rest right. is just George ranting. So part of my job was to catalog all the George rants because it would actually have more emotional content than the reads that they had written. Um, so we would go into the edit suite and we'd cut the script and, you know, the script was written off of a transcript of the interview. So that wouldn't, wouldn't exactly match the tone of what right. the person was saying. So we would, you know, oftentimes, not, I'm not giving myself, I don't want to give myself too much credit, but oftentimes we would rewrite whole sections of the show from all this stuff that I would catalog from George and all this, all the random stuff I would catalog from the interview. So it was really almost like a documentary editing where you'd create conversations from all this chaos. That sounds fun. That sounds like a fun so editing fun. job. That would be great. It is pretty fun. It's a lot of late nights. Yeah. I mean, there's, again, you're trying to pull together linguistically things that kind of match up and like, you remember something back here that fits this and it's funny because it's a disjuncture and all that stuff. So there's a lot going on, but that sounds like intellectually kind of a fun creative project. It's, it was it was really a fun show to work on. Um, and that's why the show had the weird um, timing and, and weird, you know, pacing that it had because we'd come up with a good section that worked, but then we'd have to kind of stop and start over. Like you'd run yourself into a dead end, but then that you'd just put in some a pregnant pause of the characters staring at each other and then you'd right. start over yeah. with a new conversation. Yeah, and a lot of those workarounds creatively, like when you have to back match with what you've actually got, become the most interesting things because they're odd workarounds. And, you know, just something that nobody would have thought of exactly unless you had to fix this particular problem. That's right. That's right. Editing is problem solving. So this was the, uh, this was definitely the, set, the cornerstone of that. The other thing about Space Ghost Coast to Coast is that it could only have been made by these people in this place at this time. Like maybe that's true of every show. Um, and maybe I'm not really saying anything, but it's such a weird show. Mm -hmm. You could not have made it 10 years earlier because the technology didn't exist. You could not have made it at any other network because every other network would have said no to it because it's so weird. Right. 
Um, and so, yeah, only these people, only this time, you know, only these people with this kind of taste would, where you'd get to interview the Ramones, but you'd also interview Susan Powder, who was a late night infomercial personality at the yeah. time, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's particular to its, to its era. Well, and again, I think when you, a lot of times when you just lay out elements, you know, and you're like, okay, here's the elements we've got to work with. Now make that, you know, entertaining, make that fit within the structure of the show. Then, like you said, that's the creativity goes up and you're like, oh, we right. could try this and like, well, we got to do something, you know, throw this in there and see if it works. And then you get that kind of, again, unpredicted creativity, I think. That's right. That's right. And, and it, it was kind of in it. It was the starter point for Adult Swim, of course, but part of that was that it was done so cheaply. There was some new animation, but it was when I say the technology didn't exist, like there was no new animation for each new episode. We would just re-edit existing animation to match the new thing we had edited, we'd created, you know? Um, yeah. So How many times why. can you rebake the same cookie? Well, yeah, if you if if you just have different different, you know, one new ingredient every time, it's a little yeah. different every time. Sure. No, again, I love that stuff. One of the things I like about stand-up is that it's so uh, repetitive. Like the script is the script is the script. But if you're a writer, every time you go up, you you add elements to the script. So it's all it's always got its you know core, but it's just fun to go up and like well, I wonder what's going to emerge this time. Absolutely, you know, I've I've done a bit. There are bits I've done for twenty years, and I won't do it for a while. And I'll, I'll come back and do it again somewhere, and suddenly it's got another eight minutes. Like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. That yeah. The voice of, of Master Shake on Aqua Teen is one of my good friends. And I've been around him and he's such a good storyteller that I'll hear him tell the same story like five days in a row. And I'm laughing harder on day five than, than I've ever laughed at, at the same thing. I know what's coming, you know, because he is he's a comedian who refines and refines and refines, just like you say. Yeah. Okay, so Space Ghost, cool. Uh, keep us rolling. Where else did you, where did you so, wander next? So after I had cut about, I thought I was getting in late on Space Ghost and I was edited episode 17. Huh. Um, the, the guest was Carrot Top. Uh, that's pre great. pre workout Carrot Top. Pre Roid. Pre Roid. Pre Roid, pre pre -roid. Pre -roid Carrot Top. Um, so then uh, when, a couple of the writers, uh, Dave Willis and Matt Malero, were starting a new show to, to uh, premiere on Adult Swim before Adult Swim even had a name. They convinced me to leave my good job at Turner Broadcasting as an employee and go freelance and work on their pilot. So I did that in 2000 uh, and that became Aqua Teen Hunger Force, um, which started slow. Like we did the pilot and <laughs> I tell this story, but David Matt may deny it. They started production on episode two before getting a green light. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the executives were like, all right, fine, make six, but you also have to make six Space Ghosts, which no one wanted to do because they were all burnt out on that after five years of doing that. Right. So we did six Aqua Teens and six Space Ghosts. And the next year we got to do 12 Aqua Teens and then it took off. And we were doing 30 a year for a while. Um, so yeah, I left my good job to go work on this talking meatball show that no one thought was a good idea. I ended up working on that show for 14 years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's a run. Yeah, from 2000 to 2014. That's solid. Like who, that's, that's an unusual story in the world. My, yeah. Yeah. It's very rare that you work on, that you work at one place, let alone one series for a decade, unless it's The Simpsons. Yeah, I, I think it's funny the Simpsons are now getting legacy hires, like kids of old writers. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's on, I mean, it's been going for, I mean, yeah, the first Simpsons short that I saw, I was in college. And it's still <laughs> going. Uh, yeah, so that was weird. And I saw Adult Swim go from, you know, two hours on Sunday nights to five nights a week to half of, to most of Cartoon Network's, you know, profits. Um, so yeah, I left in 2000. Yeah, I was there forever. Like I also saw it through the TV on DVD boom, uh, which was, you know, 2005 to 2008. Mm -hmm. So there was, there were years when 
Aqua Teen DVD sales were a shockingly significant portion of the pie of Cartoon Network's profits. You know, they threw us a party after we sold our one millionth DVD. Wow. Um, which is incredible. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. Um, so part of my job was also, in addition to editing episodes, I produced the extra content for the DVDs. And uh, so that was like, so I'd get the budget and I'd spend about half on production. I'd be able to keep the other half because I was writing and producing and editing and shooting them, shooting everything. We got into like shooting short films. We had enough budget to like just shoot a short film with the actors from Aqua Teen that had nothing to do with the show itself. Those are called Terror Phone. If you <laughs> want to look those up on YouTube. They're very funny, I think. Yeah, I'll bet. But it was the kind of thing where Dana was coming to town. Dave and Matt wrote a script on Monday and we were shooting in a house with props and a crew on Thursday. Yeah. And I was the producer and, and so I would line produce, put to find, find a crew because I was an indie filmmaker so I could use my contacts to get a film crew together, you know, video crew together. But we were doing special effects and all kinds of stuff for literally three days of pre-production, two days of pre-production. Um, shoot it in one day and then I'd also edit, I'd also be AD on set and I'd cut it together. So I'm real proud of those. So the, the, it's Terror Phone 1, 2, and 3. They're on the DVDs. Yeah, that's that's definitely something to check out. I have a buddy, I don't know if you know Chris McGuire. He's, he, his last show was running uh, Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg. And Snoop Dogg has a new show out. I don't know exactly what it is, but Chris posted something yesterday about, he goes, I shot 26 pages of sketches over the weekend. And here's what happens when the writers no longer want to come in and be uh, characters and it was him in a rabbit suit <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 i'm yeah i have to be a character i have to be like anyway watch the terrible they, they break a third wall they break the fourth wall whichever wall it is yeah they used to drag me into sketches i'm a terrible actor like awful i just can't it's just i've never done much of it and i'm not that interested i'm not interested in it at all but uh, i used to run the other writer's sketches regularly on talk shows they'd be like oh yeah do set i'm like yeah yeah you don't really want me in there <laughs> yeah i'm 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 bad too yeah um okay yeah, so, cool so that, that show that show's had i mean that show's gonna have a life don't you think forever like it's always gonna have its cultness and it, it certainly will that hbo max has gotten involved because they're doing new aqua teen shorts I, I did a little work on those this year um and they're doing an aqua teen a second aqua teen movie which is in production now Nice. So yes, it will go on forever. Yeah, I think you know what I what I see now, like that sort of recovering old stories and old characters, and you know, it's not even just it's just the whole the the aesthetics different. You know, the speed of the cut, it, everything is different, and so it's taking that old story and you know moving it up into this new production models and and the way you watch this up on the small screen and everything. So yeah, that stuff seems like it's always going to be nicely recyclable in a you know in a positive way. Yeah, yeah, it's always weird watching those shows that started in the early 2000s and then lasted into 2010s because they go from standard def to to HD. It's like watching Gilligan's Island go from black and white to color. Yeah, when do they when do they uh, resurrect Gilligan's Island? No. I'm surprised it hasn't come back. Right. Every other sitcom has. There's never been a Gilligan's Island like movie, right? Like a reboot movie. Yeah, was there a TV movie at it? Were it was definitely of- a 90s TV movie, like Return to Gilligan's Island. Yeah. That was the original cast. I'm talking about like the Dukes of Hazard or, right. or, uh, or Charlie's Angels reboot style reboot. Yeah, I don't think there's been a Gilligan reboot. Well, they'd have to do to like The Rock. Maybe, maybe The Rock is in, on the island now. Well, he's, he's doing Jungle Cruise, so he's halfway there. Right? It's like everything, everything that, that's in a Disney park is now going to become a movie. It's like the popcorn. What? Absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, I'm friends with um, Terry Rossio a little bit and uh, I know his wife pretty well. And I've watched them do the Pirates of the Caribbean over and over again. And I'm like, man, why don't you just make a money press? Why don't you just print a... Because at this point, yeah. it's like, just keep making the movie. I was on a panel with Terry um, at the Austin Film Festival. That's right. You know those guys, don't you? Yeah. I mean, I mean, just from hanging out at the Austin Film Festival. Um, and I was the indie, I was like on a panel with like Terry and a bunch of other like 
heavy hitter screenwriters and I did not belong. <laughs> I was like the indie, I was like the adult swim indie film guy. And then people would ask, how many of your scripts have actually been produced? And they'd be like, one out of 50. You know, and I was like, everything I've ever written, I've produced. <laughs> you know, and then and then I was talking about I made a feature while I was uh with with my DVD proceeds, I made a feature film uh in 2006. That's why I go to the Austin Film Festival, it premiered there. But I was talking about my my feature and I was like, it's not for, it's a beach party movie. Like it's literally like I tried to make an actual 60s beach party movie. So if you get the reference, you like it, you, you might even love it. But if you don't get the reference, it makes no sense. Right. Um, so I was like, uh, at least I didn't make and I referenced some movie <laughs> that I hated. And Terry Rossi was like, I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny. Like every once in a while you get thrown on panels down there. I was like that once where they had one of the original um, creators of Two and a Half Men. They had Paul Feig, you know, who had just made Bridesmaids. And then some other guy who was like a long-term sitcom guy that everybody, you know, he'd made every sitcom and then it was me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm filler. I'm, I'm That's what I just call me is filler number four. Filler, not Jerry Stiller. Jerry no, Filler. Jerry that's Filler. A, Jerry Filler. That'd have been a good. That'd have been a good reference. Where you? Where were you when I needed a good joke? <laughs> All right. So Aqua Teen, and then I knew you. That's when I met you. I think you were still in Atlanta, and, and I remember talking to you a little bit about when you were getting ready to trying to make that decision about moving to LA from you know Atlanta. And then I think we rehooked back up once you were starting to work at Di you'd start working at Disney. That's right. That's right. I I had a friend call me. I was thinking about moving. I was in Atlanta. I'd been in Atlanta for twenty years. And uh, thinking about trying LA, and then a, a, a friend of mine from Cartoon Network who had moved over to Disney was like, "Do you know any editors in LA? We can't find a creative editor for this show." I was like, "Maybe I'll come out and do it." So I did, and it was uh, Gravity Falls, um, huge hit for them. I worked on part of season one with the creator who was like 23 at the time. Nice. Uh, very, very creative guy, but a very, you know inexperience causes for some stops and starts during production. Alex Hirsch is a genius. I'm not going to talk shit about Alex Hirsch, but uh, <laughs> yeah, there was some starts, stops and starts through production. Um, and he was like of a mind that was like, why, why do we have to do all this stupid union stuff? Can I just edit the show myself? I'm like, well, not in the, not in, not, not if Disney's paying the tab. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a good experience. Like, uh, you know, like when I moved to LA and, uh, worked for Disney as an animation editor for about five years. Um, it was literally the fourth job of my adult life, which is we it's super weird. Like I- Right, yeah, that's system, nothing. And then I was at Turner, and then I was at Adult Swim for 14 years. So literally the fourth job of my adult life at age 42. So what did you think about Disney? Like, um, I mean, I know I have some writer friends that uh, write movies for them, and I think they've had a positive experience. It is its own kind of- monolith and like you said it's so big they've got to have different business practices and creative and production practices but you know i think they kind of like it the fact that it's so super organized as opposed to like the constant freelance royal and kind of just sort of figuring things out on the you know as you go sure sure and i was i went freelance and worked i was like a free full-time freelancer at adult swim so you know, there was one summer where I just took three months off. I was like, I need a break. I'm just, I've been doing this for 12 straight years full time. I need to take a break. So I took a break and wrote for a summer, which was great. Um, you know, and then, and then they like had an emergency job they needed me to do. And I did that for a month in the middle. So I didn't, it wasn't really a break. Right. I made a bunch of money, you know, cause anyway. Um, uh, so yeah, I, and then moved to, moved to Disney where it was a huge pay cut um uh to be an animation editor which got paid the same as like an assistant editor at the time um and that was just union that wasn't necessarily disney but it's just like that's the system right um and i learned that i much prefer the royal the the, the rolling chaos of being a freelancer um i like having a three-month break every six months mm-hmm you know, uh, I can go write and do my own things. I'm trying to make short films. I'm trying to write scripts. Uh, you know, doing doing other things. Starting a baseball blog. You know, 
<laughs> doing doing other things. Um, so uh, yeah, I was at Disney for five years. I worked on two seasons of Craig McCracken's show, Wander Over Yonder, which is great. Um, great experience there. I love Craig. Um, but that's that that just tells you how different animation is from the rest of entertainment. Right. Um, one season of one season two of of Wander Over Yonder. I'll break it down for you. Okay, do fill it. Some time. I'm going to fill some time here. All right, do it. This won't be boring, I don't think. No. Um, so it's 22 half hours, but there's two episodes per half hour. So that's 44 quarter, 15 minute shows, really 44 10 minute episodes. And if you think about it, like even if you're producing an episode a week, it's 44 weeks to do one part of the process. So that's 44 stories to break, 44 scripts to write, 44 sets of backgrounds to draw, 44 sets of like 44 new characters because there's like a guest character in each episode. So I cut the animatics, which is cutting the storyboards together on that. So even if you were turning around a storyboard a week, yeah, it's, that's it's forever. Like we would usually have a week or a week and a half to cut a storyboard and then it had to ship. Um, so yeah, uh, editing an animated series is like being at a train station and the train comes every week and you better get on that train because it's moving, right. you know, we're, you got to produce these episodes because you fall behind schedule and it just compounds and compounds and compounds. So that's what editing, you know, so, so editing on that show, um, I did storyboards for a year. And then I moved on to post and started cutting the animation after I got back from the animation studio. And we do little tweaks and find mistakes and have to call retakes. So, um, so you know, even if you're doing that once a week, you know, so it was two and a half years of editing on one season of television. Wow. Of animated children's television. And that, how did they, well, how did they set that up then? Like how much leeway or how much space was there between seasons and? It just rolls and rolls and rolls. You know, you, you get the green light on season two as you're finishing season one and you immediately have to start writing, you know, coming up with ideas. Um, so yeah, uh, if you haven't ever seen the show, viewers, listeners, Wander Over Yonder, it's a great kid show. It's very Looney Tunes. Voice of Jack McBrayer from 30 Rock is the is the lead character. He's great. Um, and uh, the music is great. It's like weirdly uh, bluegrassy Dixieland in outer space. So lots of space banjo. Uh, so anyway, I did that for like, did that for a long time, but then I wanted to get back into doing live action. I want to try my hand at that. So after Disney, I went freelance because um, I had some things set up. I did some adult swim shows, live action shows, uh, one called Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell, which is a sitcom, a workplace sitcom set in hell. Okay, I like so, it. So so like Satan is just like a really bad middle manager. Um, so that show is really fun. Lots of improv, lots of green screen. Um, so that's another show where you say, where, do they, where does all the stuff that people never see Right. It's a show that um, would let the actors improv for like 10 minutes extra after the scene. The show is 10 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> the entire episode is 12 minutes long. And I, here I have 10 minutes of improv. So it's one of those shows. It, it like lets the actors really play, but then that means I see 95% of their work and no one else in the world ever will unless you're right. on um, but that show is really fun. You're pretty face going to hell. And then I cut a feature with friends that made a feature called Supercon. So even on the feature, that was, you know, four or five months, six months worth of work. And then you're back to being, being unemployed again. I love that. <laughs> uh, I did a couple sitcoms. Um, and the, the difference between Atlanta and LA is like, like all the, all the TV shows are made here. Yeah. Like even if you're shooting in Atlanta, post still goes back to LA. Yeah. It's like an incredible amount of production. Um, and now that everything's opening back up, there's like a shortage of assistant editors. Like there's just not enough people to go around for all the shows that are trying to get started up. Interesting. Um, yeah. Whereas in Atlanta, there was like, if you were an animation editor, there was like two places to work. Adult Swim and, and uh, the guys who made Archer. Right. 
you know, so here there's a bill, there's a bazillion. Well, that's the thing I was saying earlier, like all the comics, the standups moving here from um, LA down to here. And LA is not a good town for standups. Um, New York is more of a standup town. Most for people sure. doing standup in LA are trying to do acting and things like that, which can make a, a nice career if you can get exposure on TV. And then, you know, your, your rates go way up when you start traveling doing standup. But the difference in moving and living in LA and just the amount of people who are doing the same work that you're doing, you know, and the fact that it's been being done there for 75 years and there's this massive infrastructure, right. it, it's just not even close. It's nothing like it. I, I describe it as a very high pressure karaoke world out here. Huh. If you're going into a karaoke bar, you're competing with some professionals. Yeah. Right. I mean, not, not that it's a competition, but yeah. No, but I did some production when I first moved here. I had a little production company and did some short uh, series for uh, Super Deluxe. I think that was yeah. Turner. And, yeah, that was Turner. And then some local company that wanted to start its own little network. And trying to do production out of here after learning production starting in, I mean, I started at Fox and then I moved to uh, NBC and CBS. And so I was always at the like, oh, this is how editors work, right? This is how it all works. And then you come out here into the freelance world and you try to produce, you know, in a town that's kind of sleepy about its production. And you're like, oh my God, you're, you're killing me. Like the director on the first thing I shot took a two hour lunch and just didn't tell anybody. Like, you know, everybody was sitting around waiting and I couldn't get him on the phone. I'm like, what? what and you happening? can't fire him because there's nobody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. I, I was in Atlanta with the, um, shooting boom was 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 cranking up. Um, so when I was making indie films, there was like, there was always like one or one and a half professional crews in Atlanta. You know what I mean? Like a big right. movie comes to town, they hire the good crew, and that's about it. You know. But after after Hollywood was shooting there for ten years, there's dozens and dozens of crews that size enough people to crew up 12 movies. Right. So when I was trying to shoot some short stuff in, what was that, 2010, um, I couldn't find a crew anywhere. Like I couldn't find anybody. I couldn't find a, a grip to save my life or an art department, you know? Um, they were all booked ye a year out. Um, it's different, it's probably a little better now, um, but yeah, like there's so much production there, it's ridiculous. Well, and again, nobody really sees it unless you're actually in the industry. It all looks like a big castle on the hill unless you're in there and you see all the flurry and you see where it's done well and where it's not done well. And you're like, oh, my God, this is like every other industry. You know, it's either like the 10 percent, 20 percent that are really resonating. And you're like, oh, that's why they're making great stuff. And then everybody over here like, oh, that's why they can never make anything that's any good. And I've seen a lot with writing staffs, you know, people sort of throwing together together staffs and not knowing how to work with comedians, you know, which is a specialized population that you need to, you need to <laughs> learn, you learn how to work them so that they will give you what you want. I don't want to offend you as a comedian, but to call comedians a specialized population is one of the funniest lines you have ever written. You know, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be nice here on the podcast. I don't, you know, <laughs> one of the, uh, Psych, I don't know. They're, yeah, they're their own thing, like getting them to be productive. And the nature of comedy is to not be productive. Right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Or to be the center of attention if you're in a room with three people. Well, and you've got the guys like that. You need some energy in the room. Like you need verbal people, but they're usually not very useful. They, they say a lot and they're entertaining, but not in a way that you can actually use in the show. But they sure. get enough energy in the room that the little, you know, nerd wonk writers who never say anything you just sit there and feed off of it and they and, end up writing the show right sure but who's gonna who's gonna tell the exec producer that oh yeah we've got these people that are, look completely useless and nothing ever they ever get says gets on the show but if you don't have their energy it's going to kill the show right and if you don't have the nerds you don't you don't ever get a, get a script written yeah and the nerds don't say anything i got a buddy i've never heard him say a funny word but every show we've ever written on together he's written the four best jokes right every time yeah, everybody has their process. Maybe it's in the room. Maybe it's uh, you know, by themselves with a computer. Yeah, I used to have a I have a friend named uh, Bob Oshak. He writes on Mar now. I used to call him the Uni Joker because he would take his hoodie and his earphones and he would just hovel into his his computer station. You wouldn't see him for three or four hours 
I'm like, how much work do these jokes need, dude? Because I'm a fast writer, but he would just un a joke. He would just completely disappear into his computer for four hours. So, yeah, everybody's sure. got their stuff. Sure. Sure. So there's, there's, there's working with comedians and then there's being social around comedians. Two different things. Well, I used to tell people all the time, like they would be, hey, man, bring some comedians to this party. I'm like, no, 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 you don't. You don't put two comedians in with a bunch of uh, citizens, like ordinary <laughs> humans. That's going to be bad because you know how, like, here's the range of what you think is funny. Well, comedians are, together are going to start up here and it's only going to get much worse. And then they're going to top each other. Yeah. It's just, you don't want, you don't want that. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The ordinary can't take that kind of, that kind of joking, but um well, okay, so you're at Netflix now. Tell me what what's uh, on the horizon. What are you wh and you're doing freelance stuff? You're trying to do more of your own stuff. Yeah, um, I was I was freelancing for a while. I had a, a some stuff come and go. Like like again, like the amount of production here is ridiculous. Like two of the sitcoms I did, I made for uh, the production company was Verizon, when, back when they had Verizon Go ninety, which was their streaming service. Okay. but you didn't need to be a Verizon customer to use it. It was free. There weren't even any ads on it. And they were producing a shitload of content for that. And then the second sitcom I was on, the, the both of them were really interesting. Like they were trying to do interesting stuff. The first one was a office sitcom in the world of um, uh, secret, not secret agents, but CIA, like policy wonks and how the CIA, like all the different, intelligence departments can be compete against each other and how office politics always trumps actually stopping terrorists that's funny yeah it's called liberty uh liberty crossing uh it's on amazon i think now but anyway it's it's a really fun little sitcom so i did worked on that um and then i worked on a talking dog show that will never come out because it's so weird um but that was for verizon and then in the middle of post on that uh verizon pulled the plug on their Go90 platform, because it didn't make any sense. I, I never even heard of it. It like here, like I I knew tons of people that were working on those shows because they were like kind of medium to low budget, but would give you lots of creative potential. So yeah, no, there was a ton, there was a ton of work out here for something that no one ever heard of, which is you know pretty common <laughs> in our life. Yeah, yeah, that's um, right. Uh so then it went back to the production studio and they finished it and then um and then they're now they're still trying to sell it anyway. So I did that and then freelance kind of, I decided to, I wanted to like buy a house and live like an adult what? in Los Angeles. I know, I know foolish, foolish <laughs> thinking. So that's when I took this uh, Netflix job and three years later, I have a house in East LA, the cheapest house in LA you can buy, but it's, but the most expensive house in every other market yeah, yeah. in the United States. Um, and I love it. Thank God I had it during the pandemic because we, now we now I'm a gardener. Never thought that would happen. I hate yard work. Um, but yeah, house projects will definitely keep you home and keep you busy when you can't leave. So you you're the only guy I've known that's ever invited me to a fig barbecue. So I think you've oh, got that's some right. kind of horticulture in you. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's that that was that that's right. That that was the first rental house I had in LA. I had a fig tree in the front yard. So I'd pick the figs and grill them and make fig uh, fig bourbon, like soak a bottle of bourbon with figs. Huh. That's dangerous stuff. You you might I have two fig stories. One's that. The other one is I live in Glendale, which is heavily Armenian and Middle Eastern. And the guy across the street used to I got to be buddies with him because his kids my kids our kids played together. And every once in a while he'd knock on my door and like just shove a plate of something in my face and be like, Dan, figs. Figs from my village. They sent they sent figs. Of course you're offering me figs at my front door. Of course you are. Yeah. 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 Glendale's super weird. Fun. It is. I, I liked Glendale. I I would have my kids out in the front yard and the uh, little old Armenian ladies who did not speak anything even remotely close to English would uh harangue me about not uh, about having my very white kids out in the sun. <laughs> I couldn't understand what they were saying, but I knew what they were saying. Sure, sunscreen. Yeah, how dare you know? It's like yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, okay, I got you. Uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, uh, took a full time job at Netflix, which has been great. They're very nice. They're very like, it's not run. It's almost, it's it's comparable to Adult Swim, and that they really just want creators to do their job. 
You know, they don't want to put them in a box or constrain them. They're like, yeah, we need that kind of show. Go make it. We're not going to har harass you. Um, the budgets are very different, of course. Adult Swim's budgets are so small. Um, well, that yeah, stuff showed up after I, like, I, I left LA to raise the kids here in Austin. So I wasn't there in the, the Netflix and the Amazon and all that kind of stuff. So I haven't seen that production, but Netflix, I don't get it. Like, maybe it's because, you know, I was there during studio and network and all that, but like, what is Netflix? Like, where do they get all this money? How's it's, this? It's not a production company. It's a technology company. So, so, and, and again, I'm not part of like Netflix mothership, Netflix central. I've only been part of Netflix animation, which they started from the ground up. Yeah. Um, you know, four, three, three and a half, four years ago. Um, when I went through Orient, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm throwing anything out because when I got hired and went through orientation uh, two and a half years ago, they had over a hundred animation properties in development or production, 110. Wow. And that's series, movies, specials, you know, limited series, whatever. Like if you compare that to like um, Disney or Nickelodeon, who will have six. Right. Yeah. As soon as you three. said that, I'm like, that's what I mean. Like, I don't understand that production, that business model. It's crazy. Right, right. Um, and it's not like there's no commercial breaks. They can be any length. So, so we'll have episodes on the show I'm working on now, which is called Kid Cosmic. We have episodes that are 24 minutes. And we have episodes that are 18 minutes. Uh, it's just whatever the story dictates. And as long as you have the right amount of animation that your budget calls for at the end right. of the thing... <laughs> You know, it doesn't matter. The story can dictate it. Um, uh, and they're very supportive. The technology, they really want to, they really want just like technology to work for you because they're a technology company. Um, so yeah, there's some growing pains uh, with any company, but, um, but it's been great. And again, I like, oh, uh, yesterday, the trailer for season two of Kid Cosmic is, it dropped. I don't know where it dropped from. That phrase always bugs me. It premiered, it came out. So anyway, there's this trailer for season two of, of Kid Cosmic um, that came out yesterday. Season two and three were announced. We've been in production on season two and three for two years, Wow, secret. Um, but they announced that season three has been greenlit. I don't know why they have to do that. Anyway, um, so yeah, like when I got hired to do this animated series, I knew it would be three years of work. Uh, and so I bought a house because I knew I would have a job. Yeah, no, so that's, that's solid. Yeah, yeah. Unca <laughs> uncancelable, uncancelable. Yeah, um, I mean there are downsides to that. It's like it's not you don't greenlit three seasons. It's really just one season right. without a break. You know, normally you don't get greenlit until you're done, and then there's a break, and then you go back into it. But we've we've gone sprinted straight through. Uh, yeah, three seasons worth. Yeah, I, I. I mean, I like the, like, it seems to me it, it does have a good vibe, corporate vibe and that kind of stuff. I worked at Fox, which is the worst vibe ever because they were importing their business model over into their, you know, running their creative shows. And I'm like, everybody here is, looks like they're about to be shot. Like, <laughs> why is everybody, the, the accounting people and the book, they're so stressed. And they would walk through the, like the accounting department had to walk through the comedian's row to get to their Oh my God. Their offices. And, and I remember one day the head of accounting just walked through and she was, if I hear a goddamn word from a comedian right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The scale of things is so shocking. Like um, adult swim development was the head of adult swim, Mike Lazo and an, an assistant. And I think he had another like kind of like a assistant development person in LA. And that was the whole development department was those three people. And then I was on a panel at the Austin Film Festival with the head of Fox development just for sitcoms. I was like, how big is your department? He's like 110 people. Yeah. I mean, granted their budgets are also a thousand, like they're spending a thousand times more money than Adult Swim is, but still, and Adult Swim's only filling a couple nights a week, a couple but hours. Still, they're not, that's disproportionate no matter how you're gonna compare it. It's incredible, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's, I don't know, I think, when I see things like Netflix come up and force new business models into that old kind of entertainment structure, you know, industry, I think it's a good thing. I think, you know, you're going to get 
it, like you said, growing pains creatively. A lot of the shows, you know, won't won't work, but the ones that do just work spectacularly. You know, it's just fun to yeah, watch. Yeah, that's the idea. Is 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 more darts to throw at a wall. Is the Adult Swim model. You know, there's a lot of shows that Adult Swim developed that you never heard of because they're right. back. <laughs> but you know, it's not like it's not like Fox doesn't develop bad shows. Yeah, well, it's was it seventy percent failure rate of all shows? I think that yeah. don't even you know I get to air. So, well, cool, man. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go so that you can go meet your dog walker. <laughs> I'm um, gonna go meet my dog walker. That's how uh, it's real life works. That you're real LA. You you yeah. serve figs. You have a dog walker. Look at that. She needs to be walked. There's the dog. Um, that, that makes for good podcasting. Showing you a picture of my dog. Does uh, the dog walker have to carry that dog? <laughs> there's a wheelbarrow involved <laughs> that's awesome well cool man it's, it's i'm glad to catch up like uh we you know every once in a while tick each other on social media or something but uh it, 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 the last time i talked to you i think was at the fig party <laughs> so, that's a long time ago yeah and i think you it's nice to see like you've uh you've grooved into la yeah yeah i love it i love it it's, 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 I tell you, the, 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 the sales point of LA to me is, is everything is cheap except for rent and, and mortgages. Like you can, tacos are cheap and delicious. Uh, but also the movie culture here. If you like movies, the movie culture here is, is incredible. It's not the making of it. It's the screening of it. Mm -hmm. Like before the shutdown, I had three or four theaters that I would go to on a regular basis to see something on 35 millimeter film that you could not see anywhere else. The new Beverly would show a double feature for $8. And it was these bizarro Kung Fu movies or 60s comedies or 70s exploitation. It's incredible. And then there's, yeah, there were several theaters that would just have repertory or weirdo programming. And it was incredible. Every week you could see something incredible. So yeah, I love that about it. Hopefully I'll be able to go back to a movie theater someday. Yeah, and I think I tell people all the time who really haven't ever lived in LA, and they're bad mouthing LA. I'm like, well, just bad mouth humanity then, because it's got everything. It's Every great. literally everything is there. And if yeah. you can't find stuff you enjoy, then you know, stay out in the whatever and hunt, go hunt because right. it's it's got everything. Yeah, uh, I was I'm really into garage rock. So if I went to a garage rock show in Atlanta, I'd see the same 30 people. Whereas LA has a garage rock scene, but there's 27 of them. You know, each neighborhood has a garage rock crowd right. you know orange county has its own garage rock scene so yeah there's everything's just exponentially bigger whatever you're looking for well, and especially you're for a guy like you in atlanta and austin you just might be in a crowd of three people yeah you know whereas here you're going to find a bigger crowd right and i tell people like i moved there as a stand-up and a comedy writer and i knew probably i don't know 100 150 southern stand-ups in LA because they all end up moving there. I knew more people from the South in LA than I knew in the South. Absolutely. And, and so it's just a conglomeration culture, you know, and like when you find your things, like I, you know, I know you've, you've got a, an aesthetic for that kind of B movie and, you know, all, all that kind of world. And it's just so thick. You can never, you can never consume it all. Exactly. If you, you, you find a vein and you, and you drill down into it and it opens up into a chasm and you never get out. I was speaking, I, like before this, I was going to be late because I started drilling into Discogs, you know, where you log all your records. Okay. And then you shop for records, which is dangerous. I started shopping for records about baseball. And I was just like, I was never going to get out of that vein. Um, so anyway, oh, I'm going to pinch, I'm going to, I'm going to pitch one more thing before yep, you go. So, um, I've written a, a, a feminist Godzilla Western feature script See, that's what i'm saying this place you know the conglomeration is perfect for you that's right that's right it's 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 essentially godzilla in the old west um but but the uh all the men in this version of the old west died and when the aliens showed up so it's a world of mostly women and just crippled old men so the women have to take on all these traditionally roles that were played by men in the old westerns so it's a feminist western but it's not a woman like getting revenge on the guy who killed her husband, right. which is the only feminist Western that has ever existed. <laughs> so I've written that script. It's essentially like, it's very good, the bad, the ugly. It's very spaghetti Western. So in order to like convince people I can make a Godzilla Western, which 
which I, I pitched it to a screenwriter friend of mine. He's like, yeah, you're gonna have to self-finance that one. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I've written, I've been making uh, feminist spaghetti Western short films. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, called the uh, Western Trilogy. I'm called, what am I calling it? Oh, it's, sorry, it's the, the hat trick the hat box trilogy i've already forgotten because i made them before the <laughs> pandemic anyway go to my vimeo vimeo.com slash j wade edwards and there's a short film called um the condemned uh which is a western that i shot with my friends on my phone uh nice. which makes it sound bad but it's actually pretty great so there's a there's a second one in production now and there's a third one being written so well, cool. Yeah, send me uh, send me any links you want. I'll throw them into the uh, the YouTube show notes, and people can check that stuff out. Uh, Great. And again, totally worth it. Like I, I've always enjoyed your aesthetic and the, your your eye for these different, you know, crazy little projects that you put together. So, well, thanks. Super cool. Yeah. We 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 could go on another whole whole uh, dead end of of uh, iPhone technology, but we'll do that another time. Yeah, I'll circle back around, and uh, next time, you know. You can uh, you can tell your dog dog walker to uh, bring you along, and we'll go on the walk with the dog, and we'll talk right. about iPhone technology. That's right. Which is the it's, it's, it's it's its own kind of rhetoric. Yeah, for sure. Well, cool, man. I appreciate it. Super fun catching up. Uh, everybody, this has been Jay Wade. Uh, check out his stuff and uh, come back again, and uh, keep coming back to the Reddit Warriors. Get out there, persuade some people. They always need it. <laughs>